at the Center for Learning and Teaching Excellence, we explore innovations in teaching at ISP. Let's talk about an experiment which re-looked at how students use generative AI when it comes to solving cases. So I'm Vishal Karungalam. I'm a clinical assistant professor of teaching here at ISB. I teach a bunch of different courses ranging from entrepreneurship to um, digital innovation. The experiment really was to help students understand the power of technology today, more specifically the power of generative AI and how they have been using generative AI and what are um, better ways in which they can use generative AI. Many students nowadays use AI simply to save time. They rely on AI-generated answers without deeper engagement. Instead of leveraging AI as a thinking partner, they let it replace critical analysis. Hence, Professor Vishal designed this experiment to challenge them to move beyond. This particular course is a very case-based course. It's, uh, it's a course where we bring in a lot of interesting problems from the industry and we discuss cases. So the usual way of doing the case is like how it's been done for many years. You give them a case in advance, they're going to prepare the case, they're going to read the case and they're going to come to class. We're going to have a case discussion and as a part of it, a lot of interesting learnings are going to come because everyone has diverse perspectives. And you'll distill all of these perspectives and you'll put some structure to it and you'll make sure you come up with meaningful learning. So it's a very typical case study methodology. The case method thrives on discussion, nuance and debate. But students are bypassing these. Instead, they use AI to generate case summaries and solutions. They are really not engaging with complexities anymore. Professor, why did you think of this experiment? What was your real sort of aim? Did you want them? Because, you know, going ahead, most of these students will be using AI in the workplace. Did you want them to experience uh, how they should use it? Was that the intention? What we've been observing um, is that most students don't read the case and come to class. Instead, what they do is they GPT the case. What I mean by that is they'll ask GPT for a summary of that case and they'll read the summary and they'll come to class, which clearly means they miss a lot of nuances, right? They don't really understand the core nuances and they're not thinking deeply about the nuances of the problem that they need to be thinking about. So that's the first observation. The second observation, like I told you, is a lot of them are using GPT to submit assignments uh, and they're really doing the bare minimum that is required. So these were the two observations that I had. So how I generally do my assignments is also I give the prompt and the case to GPT and then it comes up with the answers and then I tell it, okay, but what about this? You missed out on this. I usually tell it like, I give it like say 10 other prompts later to like improve upon it. So I looked at it from the same lens, you know, what next prompt would I, would I have given GPT to sort of improve on this answer? And then I try to look at if there was any factual error to begin with, like if it had missed out on some key aspect, like there were three uh, software service that we had to compare. So I was like looking at, has it missed out on any one of the, you know, aspects of something? So yeah, mostly it was looking at our, it, it from a lens of what did GPT miss out on that potentially we could add. Then I said, um, the challenge here is that I am not against them using GPT. In fact, I want them to use generative AI tools. I think they're very useful and you have to use them the right way. So the goal I had was to, uh, one, help them understand these tools are actually very useful, but they're only useful if you use them the right way. The second thing I wanted is I wanted them to get a realization that using these tools as the ceiling of how good your answer can be uh, is a very bad way to use the tool, right? So these are kind of two realizations. And the third one fundamentally was I wanted them to realize that the tool's baseline output, which you will get without actually working very hard, is probably as good as what we can produce in 20 minutes of shallow thinking. What Professor said that AI should be your base and not your ceiling. I think uh, we're very inclined to forget that because when we're in situations of tight deadlines, we have to save time, we have to prioritize other things, then we often just leave things to chat GPT or any other AI model without putting our, in, uh, our own brain into it. And that's something that I often think about myself also outside of this course. So, Professor, I just wanted to understand if you can tell me a little bit more about the experiment. I understand it was about a case and a solution which was given to the students. Right. So, I wanted them to understand the difference between shallow thinking and deep thinking so that they're actually able to use their critical uh, knowledge that they've accumulated over the core courses and they can come up with better answers. Which is to say that instead of just giving them a case study, 
I gave them the case study in class. So the previous class before this, I had actually given them a case study and asked them to solve the case study. And I gave them full freedom to use any tool that they want. Uh, so most of them used generative AI tools to solve it in class. And I saw that most answers were similar. Probably one group out of 10 in a class had slightly different answer, but most others gave similar answers. They didn't pick up the nuances. They didn't really um, have any you know, differentiated thinking, if you will, just one group. So I said, in the next class, I'm going to flip this. And I said, I will give you a case. I will also give you the solution for the case as solved by multiple generative AI tools. So instead of using just GPT, I used tools like GPT, Gemini, Claude, I ran my own models. So I got a comprehensive solution and I gave the solution to the students. And I said, the goal now is not for you to solve the case, but instead to critique. And critique in such a way that you will actually tell me whether the answer was good, was it bad, was it comprehensive, did it have enough nuances? And if you choose any one of these and say, yes, it was good, you need to tell me why it was good. And if it was bad, you need to tell me why it was bad and how could you improve? So that's the exercise I gave them. And for like five to 10 minutes there, I was just stuck in a brain block because I couldn't think beyond that. So it just pushed me a lot to go beyond the obvious answers and think out of the box to come up with my own solutions. And we were asked to either accept the solution or do we have any further recommendations beyond this? Or do we completely reject the solution? And what is our recommendation from that standpoint? So I felt a bit intimidated, but then when the professor told us that you have to uh, work on these answers and uh, bring up the more improvements and better answers over the top of this. So at that time, we felt that the, the AI is not a substitute, uh, but we have to feel uh, like feel that as a compliment uh, into our thinking and we have to make our own answers and based on our own business instinct, we have to come up with better answers. The experiment surprised students. They realized how well AI performs and that its answers closely mirror their own initial thoughts. It was very fascinating to actually see the way they solved the cases and came back with answers. Uh, two observations after they came back with the answers is uh, you know, we ran this test across multiple sections. A lot of students came back and said the answers that they got uh, from GPT or that was presented to them were very similar to what they would have come up with. In fact, some students remarked saying they didn't think they could come up with better answers than this. Interestingly, almost every student came back and said, yes, they could have done it differently. Right? So they could have used the output that actually came, but they could have improved it in certain ways. And when you push them on how they would have done this, why they would have done this, almost everyone came back with the answer saying they would have done it based on the knowledge that they had acquired. Now, it could be knowledge they had acquired either in class or through their own experiences or something they had seen or learned. But if you use your own expertise and you work with this tool, then the nuances that you can actually put in and get responses uh, seem to have been something that they had not tried. So when we push them, they realize using it as an augment uh, rather than actually as a replacement is a far better strategy. But I think it's just from this whole idea of saying that how can AI be good? What has fundamentally changed is now I'm going to ask the AI that, hey, what's your idea? What do you think about it? And then question it, then retweak it, then have a sort of almost try to remove the mental model, uh, model to challenge AI that, okay, if this is what you're saying, that is the baseline. So, Professor, did the students accept this? Did they have any questions? Were they interested in what was happening in class? As they were solving the case, a lot of them came to this place saying, oh, wow, a lot of things I'm thinking of are already in this. So there is this um, realization, if you will, in some sense, saying that AI is pretty good. But then there is this pushing through phase where, you know, they feel like, no, we got to do better than this. So how do I actually make the answer better? This some amount of push, right? So critical thinking kind of comes in there. So I've seen all three happen in the class. Starts with surprise saying, what is this? This is very new. Second one is saying, oh, but this knows a lot, lot of stuff. Like my basic thinking seems to have been accounted for, which also gives them the motivation to say, maybe I should do more. Like I need to think more. Why am I thinking only this much? Why can't I think deeper, right? Is a question that they're asking. So I've seen all these three emotions play out. Of course, when you are given a solution, now your brain stops working. You're now thinking that, what do I have to do? What better can I do? It's a challenging thing. But you know that the, you know, it was a chat GPT answer, right? So you know that it, it is going to do a better job than me because probably, you know, it has taken a lot of information, tons of research has gone into it and it'll do that. 
but i think my motivation to improve that was to criticize it to you know uh, do things better than what ai had done already and i was just thinking in ways that you know how can i do it differently were the students competing against ai or were they competing against each other students to try to do it in couple of different ways one set of students i've seen say that i'm not going to look at the answer not going to use it i have the case i'm going to solve it like a regular case and they go and solve the case right so on their own and then they look at the answer and that's when they say that oh but 70% of what i've come up with is already in it then they get competitive and they say but this is not good enough like i need to get better than this right so they're pushing themselves and saying i can come up with better answers so that that is something i've very clearly seen oh the second set basically says i'll see what's there and that's been interesting because they look at it and they'll be like oh this seems like a good enough answer is what they start with the experiment eventually aimed at helping students to understand how to leverage what ai can really bring to the workspace i think there is a whole human aspect of things that gpt cannot recognize the personas that had create that it had created everybody felt that they were a little flat that they could create uh, contain a more detailed approach towards personas since we know the advancements that are happening in the industry every day we understand that these are the kind of applications that can that it can be used for that i think gpt completely misses out on the whole i think the whole person aspect of it gpt misses out on so you really need to feed it prompts in that segment so essentially i think it's more about rather than building learning how to use ai to generate the best possible solution because again it will become generic if everyone starts using ai you can get the same answers also right i mean you ask the same question you'll most most likely get the same answer but um, asking the right questions essentially the right type of prompts and the right type of uh, like understanding what to ignore and what to uh, uh, what do you call what to take away from the responses that ai provides i think that will be key i'm going to keep this in mind that i don't have to align myself with what chat gpt is saying i don't have to think that oh because ai has more resources than i do then maybe it's better than me no it can't be better than me it it can definitely have more resources it can be if i can put it that way it can be clerically better than me but it can't have the originality that i can but i think it's just from this whole idea of saying that how can ai be good like it, it can't be as good as i am and i'm not saying it's as good or it's not as good that's not the argument i'm trying to make what i'm trying to help them understand is to say you with ai is invariably going to be better than you without ai or ai on its own and that's really the argument that i'm trying to build and help them understand